Um, our next speaker is one of the original people who came to Skepticon 1, and he's been back ever since. Um, Richard Carrier, here we go. All right. Yes, excellent audio. We're going. Okay, uh, I'm going to talk about miracles and historical method. And I'm going to start by telling a story. Uh, this is, a, this is a, a true story, actually, supposedly, um, allegedly. Uh, in uh, 172 AD, Marcus Aurelius and his legions were fighting battles across the Danube in, in the area of what would later become uh, Czechoslovakia. And they got in a bit of a pickle. Uh, they actually ended up uh, surrounded in their, stuck in their camp, surrounded by the enemy, out of water, out of food, uh, so they were dying of thirst. It was in the middle of summer, so they had no hope. Uh, and the, the enemy hordes were just about to besiege them. And so, of course, you know, they were, they were praying to all the gods and demons and devils they could. And suddenly, the sky filled with dark clouds, and a torrential rain poured down, and the, the massive rain was so devastating that it was crushing and destroying the enemy. And while the Romans were holding up their shields and gathering the water and drinking it, and so they were, their thirst was quenched by the gods from above, and if that wasn't enough, that wasn't cool enough, balls of lightning thundered down from the sky and it was annihilating the enemy and routing the enemy entirely. And so the, the Roman legions were victorious and Rome was saved from uh, the Danu Danubian hordes. So uh, this was a great thing. And this was part of a, a whole big campaign that he was fighting in the region. Uh, obviously, he returned victorious. And he erected, as generals often did, emperors often did in this period, he erected this gigantic column and this column is basically a comic book. Uh, it tells the story of the campaign in a spiral setup of cells all the way up the whole, uh, the whole column. And the column survives today. Uh, it suffered some damage from pollution and acid rain and stuff, but we have pictures from before it was corroded. And you can still see some of the, uh, some of the details even now. And uh, the interesting thing is uh, we actually have in this comic book, this comic strip that goes spirals up this column, the, this miracle I just told you about is depicted there. We know about this miracle from some texts. Some, some authors did write about it, and I'm going to get to that in a moment. Uh, but I wanted to show you this because this is uh, an, basically an artifact, a physical artifact, generated within two years of the event by an eyewitness who was there. Uh, and so you can't dispute it. This wasn't cop a copy of a copy of a copy. This is a, a firsthand autograph uh, text. You know, it's a visual text of the event. And so here we have, uh, you can see, see if this works, yeah, so you got this little rain god that came and saved them. You can see his wings, so that, that's how you indicate that this is a god from heaven coming to save you. And the rain is pouring down, and you can see in this cell over here, the rain is pouring into the Roman shields, they're holding up the shields and drinking from them, and, it's, and the rain is coming down and just crushing and destroying the enemy over here. Uh, and further on, uh, up, up the thing, a few cells beyond, uh, it also shows lightning bolts coming down and destroying the siege works of the enemy and so on. Uh, so this is pretty good evidence of this amazing miracle. The Christians wish they had that kind of evidence. So this is, this is the sequence of events. We had the, this miraculous battle in 172 AD. Uh, and then in 174, the column was completed. You know, it took a long time to make a really a beautiful, complicated uh, piece of architecture like that. And the first stories, the first tales that, that, that survive for us to know of them uh, begin with Christians. Uh, the Christian apologist Apollinarius in 180 AD, and that's just eight years after the event. And then shortly after him, about 25 years after the event, Tertullian, a more infamous Christian apologist, uh, wrote his account of this miracle. And the first time we hear the pagan version of it is 50 years after the account, so that's about the same distance between uh, the crucifixion and the Gospels, uh, from Cassius Dio. So let's talk about these accounts. We're going to start with the Christian version. What did the Christians tell? Now, this is the first accounts that we have, the earliest accounts, within just years. Uh, this is their story. Uh, their, their story is that Marcus Aurelius had an entire legion of Christians. And that their prayers to Christ alone saved them. It was just because they prayed to Christ and that they were saved and it saved the empire. And that Marcus Aurelius honored the Christian legion for this by officially renaming it the Thundering Legion. That's the Christian version. The pagan version, Marcus Aurelius had an Egyptian sorcerer with him named Harnufus. His spell, summoning the god Hermes, a messenger of Zeus, brought the miracle, and there's no mention of Christians. In fact, uh, the idea of a Christian legion under Marcus Aurelius is absurd on multiple levels. Uh, 
Uh, one of the things, in order to, at this time, Marcus Aurelius considered Christians to be disloyal to the empire because they wouldn't do the ancient equivalent of the pre Pledge of Allegiance, essentially, uh, which was honor obeisance to the statue that represented the guardian spirit who protected the emperor. And that was your way of saying that I support the emperor by praying to his guardian spirit. But they wouldn't do that, and so he interpreted that as uh, being basically traitors to the empire. So, and also, if you were part of the legions, you had to give prayers and certain things uh, and certain ritual cult paid to Jupiter Optimus Maximus, whom I'll introduce you to in a moment. Uh, and these are things that Christians couldn't do. So you couldn't have, Marcus Aurelius would never have Christians in his legions, and the idea of him having an entire legion full of them is absurd on multiple levels. So the story, the, the Christian story is a little bogus. The pagan story sounds weirder then. So which one is true? Like, or how, who, where is the truth in all of this? Uh, first of all, you might wonder, what, what is an Egyptian sorcerer doing summoning Hermes, the Greek god? Uh, so a little brief lesson in how pagans understood their world. Uh, they didn't think that, that Hermes was different from Thoth. They, they, the idea was that everybody was worshipping the same gods just under different names. And so you spoke a different language, you used a different word for your god. And many of the gods had met multiple names. So the, the, the pagans had no trouble with the idea of thinking that the Greek god Hermes was really just the, the Egyptian god Thoth. And the Egyptians thought the same thing back, back and forth. Just in the same way that the Roman god Mercury was just considered to be the Roman version of, of Hermes, they all thought it was the same god. You're just using different rituals and, and using different names for them. Uh, and again, Hermes is the messenger of Zeus, uh, but Zeus was equated to the Egyptian god of Ra, and the Roman version was Jupiter Optimus Maximus, Jupiter best and greatest. And that was the, the chief god of the Roman Empire and of the Roman legions. Now the interesting thing is, uh, right within the period of this war, and right in the area, in the area of what would later become Czechoslovakia, we recovered a temple that was dedicated by the emperor to Jupiter Optimus Maximus Cassius, which is the name of the sort of local deity there. But the iconography shows that this is a representation of, of uh, Jupiter or Zeus as the Thunderbolter. This is the Zeus Thunderbolter. Jupiter Optimus Maximus, the thrower of thunderbolts. Now it's kind of interesting that we have the emperor dedicating a temple to uh, Zeus Thunderbolter, right at the exact time that we hear that there was a, a miracle in which Thunderbolts saved the, the legions. So we have some physical evidence supporting and corroborating that part of the story. We also have, uh, interestingly enough, in the same region from the same time, a inscription dedicated to the goddess Isis uh, by two, two people, Harnufus, the sacred scribe from Egypt, and Terentius Priscus, uh, probably a Roman legionnaire, who dedicated it to the appearing goddess, the goddess who appears and manifests herself, and that's, that's an epithet of the goddess Isis. So here we have a Harnufus, an Egyptian sorcerer, as he's identified as a sacred scribe, uh, with the legions in that time, in that place, and that, you know, what are the odds of that? So this does look like we actually had a Harnufus with the legions. Uh, so the pagan story is starting to look a little better. Now, another thing that happened, uh, right after the war, as soon as he got back, uh, as soon as he returned from these campaigns, he uh, instituted, uh, Marcus Aurelius instituted coins. He started coining some uh, special currency, honoring something. Uh, we, can, we can guess and infer what. Uh, but the legend on the coin was Religio Augusti, which means the religion of the emperor. And it depicts on one side the bust of Marcus Aurelius, and on this side that I'm showing a, a drawing of Hermes standing in an Egyptian temple. So what are the odds that the emperor would suddenly start striking coins, honoring Hermes in an Egyptian temple as his religion uh, for? Not only did he do it immediately after returning, but the coin issue stopped as soon as the column was dedicated. So it was issued from the December of 172 AD until 174. So here we have uh, more physical evidence corroborating the pagan account. Now, let's, stop, let's top that off with one more interesting thing. You know how the Christians said that he renamed the legion the Thundering Legion because of this great miracle that they did? Well, it turns out, you know, funny thing, funny story, um, over 100 years earlier, we know that this legion was already called the Thundering Legion. Uh, and this is another inscription from Egypt, incidentally, from Thebes, Egypt. Uh, another inscription by some, uh, some officers and NCOs of uh, the 12th Legion that was the legion responsible. And it says right there, the 12th Legion called Fulminati, Fulminati, the Thundering Legion. And they date it. The inscription was made in the 11th year of Nero, which is 64 AD. So we know this legion had already been called the Thundering Legion for ages and ages before this miracle occurred. Uh, so strike one there for the Christian account. So every aspect of the Christian story is refuted by the evidence. Every aspect of the pagan version is confirmed in the evidence. Yet the Christian legend arose within just a few years, a few years, not decades, a few years, 
and it prevailed. In the Western Middle Ages, the, the, um, the pagan version was forgotten entirely. The only version that was known in the Western European area was the Christian version. It completely eclipsed and won out. Uh, and the only reason we know about the pagan version of this is because one dude in the Eastern Byzantine Empire preserved one pagan historian who just happened to mention it, uh, and just that one text. And so we only found that, found that out when those texts started creeping west uh, after the Renaissance. So, uh, so that, that's an interesting piece of facts there that you can use to compare uh, with the way Christians talk about things. Now, what, what are the... What, <laughs> What can we take away from this? Well, that. Christians were big ass liars, yeah. Um, we'll see some more examples of that before we're done today. So I'm gonna talk about Herodotus. Uh, let's go back, this is before the Roman Empire. This is back in classical Greece. Herodotus was a well-known uh, historian of the time. He became one of the most read uh, historian class texts in ancient schools later on. He's born in 485 BC. He wrote around 430 BC, give or take five years about the Persian War, which occurred in 479 and 480 BC. So roughly 50 years, he's writing 50 years uh, after the events he's recording. So it's roughly, again, the same time between the Gospels and the events the Gospels claim to describe. What does he tell us about? Well, there's certain amazing things happened during the Persian War. Uh, one thing was this really incredible defense of the Temple of Delphi, which is considered the center of the universe and one of the holiest sites. It's kind of the Greek equivalent of the Jerusalem Temple, the closest thing they had to. Uh, and this is Delphi, this is a picture of the ruins of Delphi today. Uh, and so what happened at Delphi is that the Persians were going to assault and capture Delphi, the holiest city of, of the Greeks. You know, this is, this is the most biggest embarrassing thing that could happen. Uh, but they couldn't take it because you know why? Because Delphi, the gods defended Delphi. There's literally the armor and armaments that were uh, dedicated to the temple got up of themselves and walked out and fought the Persians. And uh, there was also um, lightning bolts came down and struck them, and, cl and cliffs, cliffs miraculously started collapsing and crushing the troops as they tried to get up. And so Delphi was preserved. And so I want you to picture, like, look here, uh, try to picture it. Animated armaments fighting. You know, this would be an awesome movie, by the way, but, you know. Animated armaments, lightning bolts coming down, destroying them, uh, collapsing cliffs. Picture it. You know, you can see it. This, this is the site where this happened. You're looking at it right there. It's pretty impressive. Oh, except there's no evidence of any of that happening. But anyway, uh, moving on, another miracle that occurred uh, during this time is the Persians did one awful, blasphemous, horrible thing, is they burned this tree, supposedly. Um, they burned this tree, which is the, the sacred um, olive tree in front of the temple, the, uh, the uh, Parthenon in Athens. Um, so this, this sacred tree, they burned it, and you know, so they destroyed this, this, this holy tree, and suddenly it miraculously started regrowing and grew a new shoot a new brand new shoot, an arm's length in one day, just miraculously. So um, can you find that one, that branch? Can you figure out which one is the miracle branch? Is, it's not obvious, okay. Well, it's there, they, they said so. Uh, and also then a horse gave birth to a rabbit. It was one of the prodigies that occurred at this time, because uh, that happens. And then there was a whole town, a whole village witnessed a mass resurrection of cooked fish. <laughs> that, that's a whole town. That's a lot of witnesses. I'm sure there was more than 500 witnesses, so that's like better attested than Jesus' resurrection. <laughs> and then there's Josephus. Oh, I'm sorry. That's the wrong Josephus. Josephus <laughs> was born in 37 AD. Uh, he wrote around 75 AD about the Jewish war in 66 to 70 AD, which was when the Jews rebelled against the Roman Empire and the Romans took them out and, and defeated them. And he actually fought in this war. Uh, there's some uh, very uh, sort of funny stories about how he ended up being uh, in the pocket of the empire in the middle of the war. Um, but he uh, fought against the Romans and then switched sides and then became, uh, he was a, a client of, of the emperors. They set him up in Rome. And so he wrote stories about uh, the Jewish war and various other things. And it's important to note that he's writing just 10 years after the fact, after the events he claims to be relating that I'm going to talk about in a moment, just 10 years later. So this is, this is much closer to the events than the Gospels are to the events they claim to be reporting. And this is, this is Josephus. This is like a sober, secular-ish historian. Um, you know, one of the best historians of the ancient world, as Christians will tell you. And what does he say? Well, he says, among things that happened, these omens that occurred right before the war that were portending the doom of the Jews, 
uh, was that at midnight, the, te the temple square and the altar were lit up as bright as day, like there was some vast holy light lit up the entire uh, Jerusalem temple in the middle of the night, because that happens. Uh, and in the middle of the temple square, a cow gave birth to a lamb, because that, that, and that, you know when that happens, when a cow gives birth to a lamb, you know God's telling you you're screwed, right? That's international, that's, that's the international symbol for screwed. Um, there, there's, there's still signs in Europe that have that on there. And then the temple doors, the, the main temple doors were so huge, these giant uh, bronze doors were, uh, required 20 men to open and close. They were just these vast, impressive doors. But what they did is they, of themselves, with no one touching them, they unbolted themselves and opened themselves right in front of the odd temple guards, indicating, of course, that God had left the, the temple and was abandoning the Jews. Um, which is interesting, these, these you know, completely ridiculous, amazing things are occurring. Uh, you have to wonder, like, is that really, like, a God who can do all this, and that, that's the best confusing, un unclear uh, indications he could give? He couldn't just, like, say, I'm abandoning you unless you do X, Y, Z? No, he gives these sort of weird miracles. So it, the, the point of all of this so far is that clearly completely false legends, I mean, these are ridiculous things that are being claimed, completely false legends of completely ridiculous miracles could arise very quickly. Uh, this idea that you can't have rapid legendary development is bullshit. Uh, these stories can happen very quickly and no alternative accounts survive. Uh, this is the, the case here. We don't have uh, you know, some eyewitness saying, hey, I was there. I didn't see that. That didn't happen. If, if anyone said that, they didn't write it down. If they wrote it down, it wasn't preserved for us to know of it. Uh, so that can happen quite often, and there, there's no way that you can buy this claim that, that, that there, there, certainly someone would have refuted it if they were there. No, it's, it's not the way it works. So let's talk about Christians. I've given you an example from ancient Greeks, from ancient Romans, from uh, a Jewish historian. So, you know, let's be fair, let's be a diversity-conscious uh, critic and bring the Christians back into it. Uh, so here's an example of, in the second century, the Christians wrote a lot of books, by the way, more than the Bible. The, the book of Acts in the Bible is just the one they chose to put in the Bible. There were actually several other books of Acts, uh, representing the Acts of particular disciples and so forth. And this is from the Acts of John. And there's this interesting story where, uh, you know, St. John, the disciple John, is, uh, is traveling with his companions, his, his, some other disciples, and they come to an inn, and they're staying in the inn, and they're sleeping in, in, in the inn, and, and the bed bugs are just biting the crap out of them. They're just, they're, it's horrible, and John's extremely annoyed, and so they're biting, biting all of them, and so he commands the bed bugs in his bunk, and like, a, like an army officer, and he commands them to go stand in the corner and leave him alone, and all the bugs dutifully march in ranks, just like legions, and march into the corner and sit there in, in, you know, at attention, just like the, the soldiers would, and stayed there all night, and John slept quite fine. He didn't do this for his colleagues, by the way, so they got <laughs> continually bitten by the bed bugs. But, uh, and, and then, after all of that, after, and when the morning was done, and he slept, and he slept well, and, and except his friends were not, didn't have such a great, a great night. But after that, uh, he ordered the bed bugs back into the bed, and they marched back in. Now, the interesting, I, what I find the interesting thing about this is he put the bugs back in the damn bed. What a fucking dick. Anyway. <laughs> and then we have a similar thing. We have the Acts of Peter. Um, I won't tell the stories, but I'll just summarize the things that happened. I mean, this is the, one of the most fantastic books of Acts that we have. I mean, there's flying wizards. There's talking dogs. There's another cooked fish that's resurrected because Peter could only do the one, apparently. Uh, and a Roman senator converts to Christ, you know, and, and right in front of everybody. And all of this is in the middle of Rome itself, the capital of the empire, before huge crowds. Um, yeah, but it's complete bullshit. So you can basically make up entire cities of witnesses if you wanted to for the most uh, bizarre and unbelievable. Oh, uh, Genevieve. That's the wrong Genevieve. I'm sorry. Uh, Genevieve. This is the one I was going to talk about. Uh, this is St. Genevieve. She died in 510 AD. And the life about her, or the story of her life, was written only 10 years later. Uh, and like the Gospels, it was written by an anonymous monk who, of course, surely must have known everything about her. And this also had like tree monsters that would spring out of trees and, and, and fight in great battles for hours. Uh, there were ship levitations. There, there were ships that were sinking and she actually magically levitated entire fleets of ships. Uh, exorcisms of demons, you know, that's stock, stock stuff. Conjurations, she could conjure water and oil from nothing. Uh, better than Jesus, I guess. Jesus couldn't, Jesus had to start with something to conjure, but she, she could conjure it from you know, thin air. Uh, healings, uh, of course, she particularly was good at healing the blind and the lame. Uh, and the holy hexes, this is the coolest thing. People who would steal things from her, like her comb and stuff, would go blind. That's how awesome she was. 
But that's complete bullshit. We know that, right? It's, I don't need to explain why. So the first rule of historical method is kind of a no-brainer. Don't believe everything you read. Uh, people made a lot of shit up. The second rule of historical method is always ask for the primary sources of any claim you find incredible. Ask for their sources. And I get this question a lot. Someone will say, someone said this. Uh, how do you respond to that? And I say, well, just ask them what their source is and go read it. Uh, that, that's the first, I mean, you'll, you'll save me a lot of time if you go do that first, because usually like half your questions will be answered immediately uh, once you see that. And if, if their source also cites a source, what's their source and so on. Go all the way back and see uh, who's actually saying this, where it came from and so on. Because the third rule of historical method is not just find out if there are other sources and other evidence, which you'll also want to do, but the fourth rule of historical method is be sure you understand all the relevant aspects of the historical context, because context is everything. And I know I don't need to tell you that you, you know how context of a passage, like a verse in the context of the Bible, you're reading a text. If, the, if a Christian cites a verse at you, you go look at the text and see the context in the text, and that's very important because it often changes the meaning of what they're talking about. But there's not just the context of the text, the written text, there's the context of when and where that book was written, who wrote it, and so on. Uh, it, it makes a huge difference as to how you interpret uh, the reliability of the evidence and exactly what they're saying and why they're saying it. So those are the four rules that you need to really work with. That's just the basics. Uh, we're going to get a little more technical soon. But uh, in understanding the context, I'm going to talk a little bit more about why that is significant for the ancient world, because I'm talking about ancient miracles here. Uh, and one of which is the, the ancient world was very different than our world. A lot of things that we, when we're trying to interpret how people would react or what they would do in the ancient world, we often project our assumptions onto them. Uh, like we assume things then are the way they were today. But we live in a radically transformed society, I mean, in ways that, that are really hard to fathom. Uh, and one of the examples of this is literacy. I mean, we're, we're all literate, we can all Google something. Uh, so those are two things we can do that they could not. Um, but they didn't have the kind of extensive literacy we did. And they, their literacy was much lower. Um, in the terms of literacy that you would need to actually do investigations and things like that uh, would be full literacy, and that's uh, only 10%, less than 10% of the population had that skill. Uh, but also, books and documents were extraordinarily expensive. Uh, a cost of one blank page of papyrus was 30, but the equivalent, you can do the math, it was the equivalent for 30 bucks. Now, as I'm sure there's a lot of students here today. Can you imagine paying 30 bucks, 30 bucks per piece of paper? Uh, it, that this is really, these are outrageous prices. And consequently, the cost of a whole book, which was not just a, cost, a piece of blank paper, you also had to pay the guy who was going to copy it out by hand, right? So there's no, there's no printing presses. Uh, so it's, this is very expensive. Costs of books were in the in $10,000 to $100,000 range. So books were extraordinarily expensive. Uh, so this is something to keep in mind. This changes the way things, are, the way you understand how things go in the ancient world, what the context is. And also there's cultural differences, the, way, the attitudes and assumptions of people. Um, and this is an example here. These are the statues of Memnon in Egypt. Uh, they've, they've been corroded by history. They used to be much, much more beautiful uh, sculptures than these. Uh, but you know, acid rain and things have destroyed them. Uh, but the interesting thing about these is these were miraculous statues. Because, uh, oh, one thing to note is the pagan statues could also weep and bleed just like the Christian saint statues can. So clearly the pagan gods are just as powerful as the Christian god. Uh, so there was a lot of weeping and bleeding and moaning statues and statues that could speak and so on. There were lots of these. And these were the, among the singing and moaning statues. Uh, they would actually uh, uh, hum and sing and, and, and do cool things like that. And uh, it, was so, it, was, it was the cool thing to do would be to go here, hear the statues moan, and then uh, pay for a really expensive inscription boasting that you did. And you remember that thing I showed you before about the Thundering Legion? That's one of those, actually. That's where we got this. This is an inscription at the statues of Memnon attesting to the existence of this miracle. And this is uh, a couple of guys, uh, officers uh, with the Legion, uh, with the Thundering Legion, the 12th Legion. Now they put on there, uh, Audimus Memnonum, we heard Memnon. This is, a, this is a first-hand eyewitness document. Uh, the autograph, it's not a copy of a copy. It's physical evidence. We can absolutely date it without question to when it was done. Not only did they attest to the miracle as eyewitnesses, but they even dated it to the hour. They have the third hour on that particular date in that particular year. Now, can you imagine if we had that for like the resurrection of Jesus? No, we don't, uh, not at all. Uh, and here's another example of the, of the sort of first-person autograph physical evidence of miracles. This is an inscription at the Asclepiaeon at Epidaurus in Greece. Um, this is a famous place where it was kind of like a, a hospital slash healing temple. Uh, 
and it was, it was famous for a long time, and so over hundreds of years, people who went there and received miraculous healings would commission inscriptions honoring the god and honoring their, and boasting of the, the great miracle that was done for them. And there are hundreds of these inscriptions, and this is just one of them, uh, and it reads as follows. Euhippus had had a spearhead stuck in his jaw for six years. As he was sleeping in the temple, the god came and extracted the spearhead and placed it in his hands. When day came, Euhippus departed cured and he held the spearhead in his hands. That's right, Euhippus, that's exactly what happened. We don't have anything like that kind of evidence for the miracles of Jesus, for example. Uh, and one of my favorite examples, because it, it kind of parallels what you would want for the origins of Christianity, uh, and, 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 uh, is we actually have an eyewitness to the origin of a new religion, uh, an eyewitness who wasn't just a gullible believer, but a, a, a talented, educated skeptic. And can you imagine if we had someone like that who'd witnessed the origins of Christianity and wrote about it, and the Christians didn't burn it, and we got to read it? Uh, so this is, this, is the, this is the story of the religion of Glycon, the cult of Glycon, as I'll talk about in a moment. The guy who founded it is Alexander of Abonotychus, and the guy who exposed it to, no absolute, to absolutely no effect on its success uh, was Lucian of Samosata. Uh, both these guys come from Turkey, what, what would become Turkey. And uh, so, Lucian, uh, the interesting thing with Lucian is he, like, he was a traveling orator, he was an Epicurean philosopher, uh, and was kind of like the James Randi of the ancient world. He was really good at figuring out the tricks that, that uh, temple leaders and so forth would use to dupe the public. Uh, the, the common things that are actually, that if, you, if you know things like magic tricks about how to do cold reading and hot reading, and the kind of uh, uh, prophecy tricks, and to be able to read letters inside sealed envelopes and things like that, uh, all, that all those tricks were being used back then, but people actually believed that shit. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't entertainment, it was actual miracle working. Uh, so if you're interested in that kind of stuff, you want to read this story. It's Alexander the Quack Prophet, uh, written by Lucian. It's an eyewitness account. Uh, by a skeptic who was there witnessing these things, and it's a really fascinating story and funny, because the guy's kind of funny as well, Lucian. Now, the interesting thing is, Alexander of Abonotychus, what he did was, he claimed that the gods had delivered unto him this miraculous egg, and he, he showed people this miraculous egg, and it cracked open, and birthing from the egg was this strange new snake with a human head. And then he, he took care of this snake over the years, and it grew up into a great, large, giant snake with a big human head that could talk. And so he set up this temple, and, and people would go to this temple and go basically uh, uh, submit questions, not directly, but through an intermediary, to this god, and the god would sit there, and this talking head would tell them, uh, answer their, their prayers or answer their question and give them oracles. And this became a huge cult. The town really celebrated it. Uh, they even got the, the emperor of the entire Roman Empire to take notice of this cult and not only change the name of the town in honor of it, but also uh, issue coins in honor of their new god. Uh, so this was a very successful religion. It continued for several centuries after this. And uh, so again, it's an eyewitness account by an expert skeptic I'm talking about here. Now the interesting thing is we have really good physical evidence that this existed. Uh, from the time that the god and, and the cult originated, we have statues of the god. Of course, why wouldn't you make statues of this god that you're worshiping? Uh, here is Glycon. Uh, this was carved from life, of course, I'm sure. <coughs> And uh, oh, the interesting thing is, if you look at it, it does look, the human head, that doesn't look very human. It's kind of weird looking, um, probably because it was fake, uh, although they didn't know it was fake, uh, except Lucian tried to tell people it was fake. And what Lucian figured out that it was is that it was a puppet head attached to a trained snake, that this large, a large snake that was trained to behave in the ways they wanted. And they had a puppet head with, with a tube that they would speak through so that the voice would come out. So, and, and we know we actually have a book by another, uh, another author called Heron, Heron of uh, Alexandria wrote a book about how to build these apparatuses, not, not this particular one, but various other apparatuses to make miracles look amazing in temples using the technology of the time. So this is actually a plausible thing that they might actually have done this with the puppet head and the tubes and all of that. And so, uh, so of course, when they carve this, they're carving basically a, from life of a puppet head that they think is a real head, and, but it, we can kind of tell it looks fake even now. And here's the coin uh, that issued. Once again, you can see depicted on the coin is the god Glycon. And on all his glory, you see everything that from beginning to end. This is like the, the most sacred object you could ever have. Uh, the legend reads, Glycon, god of the people of Ionopolis. Uh, now, that used to be Abonotychus, but the reason it's called Ionopolis is the emperors renamed it because it's the, it's the, the city of Io, which was the, one of the names of Apollo. And this was supposed to, Glycon was supposed to be the son of Asclepius, who was the son of Apollo. So it's kind of a sub-Apollo cult. Um, 
And the town still has that name. It's in Turkish now, it's Ineboli, but Ineboli derives from Ionopolis, the original name. And yes, the town still exists. So here, here we saw the beginning, the dawn of a new religion uh, with a skeptic that gave us a really good account of it. And we wish we had an account like that uh, from someone who had witnessed the origins of Christianity. If only Lucian could have stumbled and could have been alive at the time of, uh, uh, that was second century, mid second century. If he had been alive and in Jerusalem at the time of the origins of Christianity, that would have been very helpful to us, I think. Um, but the thing is, if he was there, he probably wouldn't have been in the glycon uh, cult scenario, and then so we'd all be worshippers of Glycon now, we'd all be, or, or like atheists, we'd be here attacking the Glycon cult and their apologists. Uh, so in the ancient world, uh, there were things that were much rarer than they are now, and things that didn't exist that we take for granted now. Um, the interesting thing is I, when I wrote this table, and I, I just because I consciously kept its original, uh, the, the original items on it, uh, I didn't even think to include the internet because the, when I was first giving versions of this speech, the internet was not like something that everybody used. Now it's just like everybody, you can pick up your phone and Google something immediately. Uh, so you can add to the no list um, all the fucking internet shit that we've got that's pretty amazing now. Uh, but no, they didn't have even newspapers. The irony is that newspapers are now becoming a thing of the past. So that's how much things have changed since I wrote this table. Is that newspapers are or has been item now. But anyway. Uh, they didn't have newspapers then. They didn't have telephones. They didn't have photographs. They didn't have journalists. And they didn't even have what we would call detectives. Um, and rare among these things was education. I, like I showed you, only 10% of the population or less uh, could even could have uh, effective literacy. Uh, rare was critical thought. I mean, critical thought wasn't really particularly taught in schools. Uh, you had to be uh, you had to be lucky. You had to go become more advanced uh, thinker and more advanced in the education system to get anything like critical thought training. Uh, scientific methods, they had some, but again, not many people knew of them or used them. Uh, you had access to documents was not easy. Uh, it's not something like we could go get access to all kinds of documents now, but they, they, for them it was much more difficult to do or impossible. And very rare were Lucians, skeptical investigators, people like Lucian, um, not a lot of those guys. So let's talk about instead, if they didn't have all of that stuff, if they didn't have the ways that we would check a claim or the way that we would be critically, how, how we would critically respond to a miracle claim, how did people back then, in general, the masses in general, uh, how did they decide whether a story was true or not? Why did they believe all of these ridiculous miracles? Why did these things spread so quickly and or were, so, were so successful uh, as beliefs? And the reality is, is that people used certain kind of uh, fallacious heuristics to sort of decide what was a true story. One of them is moral behavior. If the guy coming and is telling you the story is an upstanding moral person, they do really nice things and, and they seem like a real all around great guy and are actually and, and obeying certain strict aesthetic uh, principles, so they show that they're disciplined and are willing to make self-sacrifices for their God. Um, obviously, they can't lie, right? So, you know, good people never lie. Uh, and that actually was kind of a criterion they would use. So obviously, if you wanted to get away with lying, what do you do? Uh, you act like one of these guys. You'd be an ascetic who's a real moral, a moral upstanding dude. Then you could convince people of any damn thing you wanted. Uh, rhetorical persuasiveness. Um, now you think, it, you know, it's kind of a joke, think Fox, Fox News, but it's actually kind of serious. You think of the way that Fox News distorts the facts, makes up facts, and then manipulates the public to believe certain things. And this is in our day and age when you could immediately Google something and immediately find out that it's false. But, you know, we still have like 20% of the populace that doesn't even do that basic stuff. And this is in the modern day of, of universal literacy and Google and all of that. Uh, imagine, just imagine how much worse it was back then and how readily someone who was very good at rhetorically presenting an argument and making a case could persuade people to believe it. Um, if Fox News could do it now, uh, you know, just any, any talented con man could do it then. And then there was the ability to wow an audience, usually with charismatic, in other words, psychosomatic, miracle working, um, or outright tricks. I mean, if you were a total liar, you could, you could do the tricky stuff like uh, Alexander of Abonotychus was clearly uh, deceiving the public intentionally. But of course, there are a lot of charismatic miracle workers actually do believe they're miracle workers because they don't know about psychosomatic illnesses, they don't know about psychosomatic effects, uh, and there's lots of different ways that they trick themselves into thinking that they're doing great miracles, and then the people that they're doing them for are also in, in front of are also convinced. Uh, and the thinking for this was that you couldn't do great miracles unless God was backing you, right? Because only God could help you make these miracles occur, and God wouldn't back someone who is wrong, right? So if you could do these miracles, you clearly had some, you had, clearly had to be t saying something that's true because God wouldn't back you otherwise. And that was the kind of thing, you could poke all kinds of holes in this reasoning. And if Christians were making these kinds of arguments now, uh, we'd have a much easier time of it. But, uh, but back then, this was the kind of the way that people would think. Uh, 
And then there were, you would decide whether to believe something based on whether it was good for you, whether there were rewards for believing. Like, for example, maybe you're not uh, in a situation where you're getting food regularly, and there's these Christians who are giving you food regularly, uh, and, and they're being really nice to you, and so you want to keep getting food from them and, and, and joining their community. The way to do that is you just play along, and you, you, say, you might even convince yourself that it's true. You might as well believe in this, because at least it's giving me my daily bread. Uh, and that's just one example of the ways that you could get rewards, material rewards and social rewards and other kinds of rewards from being a belief participant, uh, and whether you were a sincere believer or not. And that's how claims would spread. Now, all of this, uh, I've been talking about the ancient world and the ancient context and understanding the importance of context in uh, interpreting stories and so on. Uh, but it's not just about miracles. Uh, the, what I'm going to talk about here today is not... Uh, miracles are just a fun example. Uh, that, and, and they're useful in other ways, these examples I've given. But uh, the methods and logic of history apply to all claims. So what I'm about to... I'm now to go to the mode where I'm going to talk about how historians actually do examine historical claims and what sort of methods they use. Uh, and I'll be talking about miracles as examples, but these skills, these exact same skills, are applicable to any historical claim. So think, think broadly. These are, these are broadly applicable skills. And learning how to think like a historian, which is something I want to try and accomplish uh, for you today to, to make you a skeptical, critical historian, historical thinker. Uh, to be able to think like a historian and to skeptically approach claims about history is an essential skill of citizenship. You need to know this stuff. You need to learn how to apply it. You need to know how historians do some of their work. Uh, because political policies and ideologies are often defending, defended using claims about history. Uh, claims about history are, are like the bedrock of a lot of decisions that are made that affect millions of people's lives today. Uh, so as a citizen, especially as a voting citizen, uh, you need to be a historian, at least in the, the amateur sense that any citizen should uh, understand science news and science information as well. So we talk about science education, and people have to be, to vote responsibly, you have to understand science. You also have to understand history, because history is just as important uh, to the political process. And by the way, uh, I, I, I'm not picking on Republicans or Libertarians here, liberals also, uh, all of you, liberal, Libertarian, and Republicans have myths and mythologies, uh, just like the ancient religions did. Uh, these are stories, claims about history that are either not true or slightly not true uh, or, or out of context and so on. So you all need to like examine your own, uh, your own historical assumptions, your own historical beliefs, as well as those of your political opponents. And the important questions to ask about a historical source, uh, and this is a list of kind of the, the most important ones. What evidence did the author have, for example? It's a surprising how, how often people don't think to ask this question. I mean, he wrote it down. He must have known what he's talking about, right? <clears throat> what sources did the author use? How did the author come to know what he reports? Or she. I say he because in the ancient world, it was mostly he's, and the Christians didn't preserve all the books written by she's, unfortunately. There's a few. I think we got some poetry. Uh, but we have, uh, I, I just want to do a shout out um, for the sake of the poor women whose books got uh, forgotten and thrown in the trash. We, we have several women who were doing scientific writing and historical writing in the ancient world, uh, wrote histories and memoirs and so on. Um, we don't have any of it, uh, so, which is kind of sad. But uh, the reality is, uh, even then, uh, women would be a small percentage of the, the writing public. And now, uh, that's even smaller percentage because the Christians were not big fans of female literature. Uh, and what was the original date of publication? This is another thing. When you, when you want to, the first rule of historical method, ask for their source. What's your source? And then you tra track all the way back to the earliest that you can get in the evidence. What date was that written? How close to the events was it? When did the author write it down? Has it been accurately preserved? That's a big question because these documents were, went through copies and copies and copies by hand over a long period of time. Uh, and what were the author's background and objectives? Why did the author write it down? What was he trying to accomplish? Uh, these are the really these are important questions to ask. And what does the particular claim actually mean in the context of its time, society, and culture? That, that issue of context, again, is important. And this, when, you, when you're asking these kinds of questions, it leads to the stages of historical analysis. And this is what historians do. This is professional history. These, and one particular historian might not do all of these stages. We build on each other's work. So we might have one expert do one stage, and then the next expert comes along, takes what they've done, and does the next stage, and so on. And, but all of us usually have some of the skills in all of these particular stages of analysis. And the first is textual analysis, particularly for ancient history. Uh, and that's textual criticism and paleography. That means the study of whether and to what degree a document we presently have is authentic 
and accurately reflects its original. Um, and this always, it's not black and white, it's not accurate or inaccurate, it's degrees. Uh, and so we, there's a, a whole science dedicated to doing this and, and trying to figure out what the, how far back we can take the text, how we can uh, check errors and changes in the text over time and, and figure out what, uh, what looks closest to the original. Then once we've done that, once we've figured out uh, our best guess as to what the text originally looked like or as near to it as we can get, next we do literary analysis. We have to ascertain what the author meant in the basic sense. Uh, and that's through a uh, thorough understanding of his language, uh, of the historical, cultural, political, social, economic, intellectual, and religious context. All of these things affect uh, the meaning and significance of what the author is saying and why he's saying it. Once you've done that, then you do source analysis. You want to identify and assess the author's sources in as much as you can. In the ancient world, they weren't very good at explaining or identifying their sources, but they did from time to time. Uh, the Gospels never really mention or never really name their sources, for example, but we do have other historians who do and talk about their horses and sources and even talk about their sources critically sometimes. So uh, that's the kind of thing that we can do. And we can also analyze if we know a lot about the background, if we're expert historians in that period, we know what kinds of sources they would have had available and how those kinds of sources would have influenced the, the writing of their text. And then finally, once you've done all of that, I mean, that's a lot of work already, the next thing you do is the, what you would normally call just historical analysis, the, the proper historical analysis of the text, of just assessing the reliability of a particular claim, as, as we now understand it from all the rest. So that's the process of what historians go through to try and figure out what happened in the past. Uh, of course, this leaves out a lot of questions. Uh, for example, like how, how do you know you're getting it right? How do you uh, come to uh, conclusions in this? Now, I argue uh, that this gigantic scary equation uh, mathematically models the correct way to do it. Uh, I'm not going to talk about this very much uh, today. I, last Skepticon, I did the whole talk on Bayes' theorem, by, that by the end of which you'll actually understand what this equation means. Uh, so if you, want, if you want to know more about Bayes' theorem, uh, you can go watch that, or you can read my book, which I'm selling uh, today, Proving History, which is really written for humanities majors to sort of get them to understand the mathematical concepts underlying this and why they're important to skeptics in general, why atheists all need to know Bayes' theorem and be able to understand how to reason uh, like a Bayesian. The simple, I'm going to just cut it down to the simplest uh, the thinking of it, and rather than talking about the specific mathematical relationships involved, I'm just going to talk about what are the core premises that you plug into this equation that get you the conclusion? And there, it's basically just this. It's how typically is the hypothesis true that you're testing? In particular? How, how typically is it the case? That's one of the questions you ask when you're thinking like a Bayesian. Another is, how likely is the evidence? If that hypothesis were true, let's assume it's true, how likely would it be that we would have the evidence we have instead of some other kind of evidence? And then the other, you ask the opposite question, which is, how likely is the evidence otherwise? How likely would we have that evidence if something else was true? Uh, and, and so you want to compare multiple hypotheses. You can't argue for a hypothesis in isolation. This is actually one of the most common mistakes that even professional historians make, is they pick a hypothesis, and then they look for evidence to support that hypothesis. They don't think to compare alternative theories of the evidence uh, to see how well that theory also explains the evidence, because often it does it just as well in which case you can't decide between those two hypotheses. And there are four numbers in Bayes' theorem. The fourth one is just the converse of the other. So if, if, if the first one is 80%, the other is 20%, if, or if it's 90%, the other is 10%. So really, once you know the one, you know the other. So there are really only three numbers, uh, three estimates of probability. And that's what all empirical reasoning, and especially all historical reasoning, is based on. It all comes down to this. If you were to pick any argument that any historian makes, whether he's aware of it or whether she's aware of it or not, doesn't matter. If they're making a sound argument, you can break it down and figure out the underlying assumptions in that argument will break down and come to just these three estimates of probability. And to sort of break it down to even simpler form, that prior probability is really just a question of what has usually happened before. That's the kind of thing that you're asking. Like what, what typically happened before and based on uh, the kind of evidence uh, that we've gathered in the past. It's based on our background knowledge, what we've learned about the world and about people in general, and about the culture we're studying in general. And that's usually what, what has usually happened before to cause the kind of evidence we have. And that's the kind of question you're asking for prior probability, and that's that first number in the equation. And then the, others are, the, the other two numbers are consequent probabilities. And that's basically how expected is the evidence we have? Is it the evidence we expect to have? Uh, and that's you test that question in two ways, if our claim is true and if our claim is false. And of course, if our claim is false, then something else is true that caused that evidence. So you have to think of what other possible causes may have been. So, and that gives you those three numbers uh, that define all Bayesian reasoning. Uh, 
And the kinds of thing that we're thinking about here is what evidence would we normally expect to have for the specific claimed fact or event? And for the claimed phenomenon in general, if it existed in general. Now, these are two things to keep in mind. Not only are we going to be asking about, for example, if that specific event happened, then it might have left certain kinds of evidence. But then we have to ask, for example, if Egyptian sorcerers could cast spells that thunder, bring uh, you know, rain and lightning down upon the enemy, if that power even existed in general, what kind of evidence would we expect to have in the world? Obviously, armies would be marching across the world uh, calling lightning down on their enemies all the time because, you know, the Egyptian sorcerers would be a hot item. Everybody would have them. So you want to think also in terms of these general terms of what kind of evidence we would have. And we're used to this. You're probably used to doing this when you're arguing about the existence of God because a lot of the, the, the arguments you make for the non-existence of God are this kind of broad general evidence, like what would the world be like if there really was a God? And that's kind of opening your mind and realizing, oh, you know what? The world would be totally different uh, if there was a God. And another important piece of this is that uh, it's, it's unexpected evidence. And this is a basic general idea. When you're talking about expected evidence and unexpected evidence, that's really code for probability. That's really a mathematical statement, whether you're aware of it or not. If you say the evidence is expected, what you're really saying is that it's probable, and so you're actually estimating probability. When you say it's unexpected, you're saying it's, un it's improbable. So you're, actually, you're really making mathematical assumptions in your head whether you're aware of doing this or not. And expected and unexpected evidence includes missing evidence. So even unexpected absences of evidence. So if, if there's missing evidence and you, you, that's unexpected, you should have that evidence, but it's not there, uh, that's improbable. So that actually lowers the probabilities and affects the equation and affects your conclusion. And so the typical thing when you're dealing with miracles is you follow this kind of decision tree, and this is sort of the way you would do it as a Bayesian. You, you would first start with, you know, what, what evidence is expected if the claim was made up? Because that's the obvious competing hypothesis, right? Uh, is, is it the evidence that we have? Um, most of the time it is. Uh, and so if the evidence we have is exactly the evidence we would expect to have if it was made up, then that evidence does not support a miracle at all, because both miracle and non-miracle make the evidence equally probable. If not, however, if the evidence is not what we would have, is not exactly what we would have if it was made up, how unlikely is the evidence we have if it was made up? It's an important question to ask. Is that as unlikely as the claimed phenomenon is generally? Because those are the two probabilities you end up comparing, and that's the prior probability and the other. And if not, if it's not, then the claim is still probably false. So even if the evidence is unexpected, even if it's improbable on the made up claim, if you say it's made up, but the evidence is not exactly what you'd expect, it still has to be as improbable. The evidence that you have has to be as improbable as the phenomenon is improbable generally in order for that evidence to be enough to make that claim probably true. And that's really hard to do with miracles because miracles are claiming things with extremely low prior probabilities. And I'll give you an example uh, to talk about how to think about prior probability. If I told you I had an interstellar spacecraft, um, people don't think of X-wings as interstellar spacecraft, but yeah, they are. They actually can jump between, uh, between star systems. Um, and and the, oh, this is an authentic picture, by the way. It's absolutely, this, this happened in World War II. Um, uh, <laughs> um, if I told you that I had an interstellar spacecraft in my backyard, uh, you would immediately doubt me, and you would expect a lot of evidence before you'd believe me. And why is that? Why, why is that? And the reason is, is because you have extensive background evidence that people don't have interstellar spacecrafts in their backyards. Uh, in fact, people don't have interstellar spacecrafts full stop, uh, yet, anyway. Um, and you know this. You have this vast background knowledge. So you know that even if I did have an interstellar spacecraft, or even if they existed at all, they're, they're so rare, that they're so uncommon, that you haven't seen one yet or ever heard of one, anyone having one yet. Uh, so that's, that's, pretty, that's pretty rare. So you know the prior probability of this is really low. So you need evidence that's even more improbable than that, uh, unless uh, it's more improbable than that unless it's true, unless I really did have that ship. And you can think of the kinds of evidence I could present to you, like I could actually take you up and to the next star system in it, for example. Uh, there's kinds of evidence I can give you that would be so much more improbable unless I really did have the thing. Uh, and then that would be really good evidence. And that's why you need extraordinary evidence for extraordinary claims. It's a proper Bayesian uh, analysis of this. But it's all based on this background knowledge of what's typical. Uh, interstellar spacecraft are not typical. In fact, they're so untypical that we don't know of any. But what if I told you I had a nuclear missile in my backyard? Now this, at least, you have enough background evidence to know that these exist. Uh, some people do have them. Uh, usually they're, thankfully, governments that have them. Uh, 
Um, but nevertheless, people have access to them, so it's not impossible in the way that an interstellar spaceship might be. It's not impossible for me to do this. So I could have uh, this thing. But it's still very rare, so you would still need a lot of evidence. And this is, so this is something that's not even ridiculous, like an interstellar spacecraft, but it's still very improbable, and therefore I would still need very good evidence to convince you. But what if I told you I had a car? Uh, I wouldn't need a lot of evidence to convince you of that. In fact, you'd probably just accept it on my testimony directly. Why? Because, well, lots of people have cars. It's not uncommon to have a car. So you don't need a lot of evidence to believe that I have a car. And so that's how you reason about prior probability. It's all about what usually turns out to be true when we really get to check. And the usual suspects when you're talking about miracle claims, for example, um, or even lots of history claims, not just miracle claims, lots of historical uh, claims go through this evolution of change and distortion. Um, human memory sucks. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you have followed uh, the science on that of late. Uh, that's one cause of uh, uh, distorted claims. People lie. Um, we know this. Uh, I gave you several examples already. Speculation gets conflated with fact. This is another thing that happens as a story gets transmitted. People speculate about what sorts of things might have happened, and then the next person reports that, leaving out the speculative caveats, and it becomes it's reported as a fact, and then it gets passed on as if that were part of the witnessed facts, even though it originally became a, it was originated as a speculation in the chain of causation. Also, fallacious inferences. People will assume something had to be true for the whole story to be true, and so they'll add it to the story as they pass it on, and then it becomes reported as something that someone saw, even though, in fact, it never was. And then there's myth-making, which is, uh, uh, I'm finding now is much more common than people thought uh, in the writing of ancient texts, which is where you make up a story, the point of the story is the allegory, the sort of symbolic meaning of the story, that the truth of it is not the primary purpose of the story. And so that happened a lot in the ancient world as well. And so we know from many, many examples, just like knowing about cars and nuclear missiles, we know these are far more commonly the causes of miracle claims and amazing claims and extraordinary claims in history. So these all have higher probabilities than miracle uh, and supernatural explanations. Now these all fall under the it's bullshit category. Uh, and the reason I say that is to economize my next table. Um, this is the ladder of explanations from highest to lowest prior probability. And I don't have time to go through this and explain why this order is correct. Uh, that each item on this list is far less probable, has a much lower prior probability than the item above it, uh, significantly lower, all the way down. And you'll notice that God is on the bottom of the list. It's the least likely explanation of almost anything you run into. There are many more ridiculous explanations that are more likely and have a higher prior probability uh, than it does. Uh, and so I've created this sort of hierarchy of things here. And then if you start talking about specific gods, like a Catholic god or a Protestant god, now you're getting even more improbable because now you're not talking about a general god, you're talking about a very specific god prior probabilities reduce even more. You need way more evidence for that. And some of this stuff I'm going to talk about, for example, the argument to the best explanation. Now, if you want more on this, uh, my book, Proving History, goes into it. I'm running out of time, so I'm not going to be able to go into it in detail. Uh, but you have these, the basic idea of this is you have the five criteria, and the more a claim fits these five criteria, and the more it fits them than competing hypotheses, the more likely your hypothesis is, hypothesis is to be true. Now, it turns out that these, these five criteria are all the sort of colloquialisms for Bayesian criteria, the thinking of Bayesian. The idea of plausibility is just another word for prior probability. A plausible claim has a high prior, an implausible claim has a low one. And ad hocness, making things up to make the theory fit the evidence. The more things you make up, the lower you're, you're lowering the prior probability, and I, ex I demonstrate why in my book. Uh, so that's actually just another piece of the way you analyze prior probabilities. And the others are all just measures of the consequent probabilities, the probability of the evidence given uh, the hypothesis you're testing. And then we have the argument from evidence, and this is what historians generally do. This is what you run into, historians often will talk about. We want these kinds of evidence. The more you have of this list of five items of evidence, the more likely uh, it will be the historians will take the claim as true. You want these things. Uh, and, and I don't have time to go into the whole example of how uh, you can refute the resurrection of Jesus by going down this list, because Christians claim that the uh, resurrection of Jesus is the best attested historical event in history, even better attested than Caesar's crossing of the Rubicon, and you can actually show them point by point that it's exactly the opposite. Um, and so these are the kind, again, the reason these are good pieces of evidence, the reason historians like these is because the probability of their existing is very low unless the event happened. Not so low that it's impossible. The, these, these kinds of evidence can exist for a, for a false claim, but it's less likely. And the more of these things you have, the less likely it is. Uh, so therefore, that's why this is good evidence for it. And so it's Bayesian reasoning actually explains why historians like this kind of evidence here.
And uh, so you can talk about physical historical necessity is the main thing uh, where history couldn't have proceeded as it did had it not occurred. Um, Julius Caesar couldn't have conquered Rome and, and won the Civil War had he not crossed the Rubicon, whereas all you need is a belief that Jesus rose from the dead to give us Christianity. It's not necessary for Jesus to actually be resurrected. So that's an example of that. And physical evidence. We've seen examples of miracles for which we have physical evidence. We don't have anything like that for Jesus. And the same goes for the other kinds of things that we have. So what I've given you here is a complete toolbox for analyzing historical claims, those four rules of historical method, the sort of basic things that you need to know and do right away. The four stages of proper historical procedure, even if you yourself don't do those things, you need to know that those are the things that are being done or need to be done for a proper sound historical analysis. And that way, knowing that those things need to be done, you can check whether they're being done if you have a historical claim thrown at you. And then there's the argument to the best explanation, which is those basic criteria. And if you can think like a Bayesian, you can even use them even better than uh, historians do normally. And the argument from evidence, which is those five types of evidence, the best kinds of evidence you can have. And uh, I didn't put in the criteria of a good historian this time, but there are ways to measure also whether a historian is a good historian or not. Uh, and, and some of the things are kind of obvious. I don't need to go into them. And then Bayes' theorem, if you want that. So you really need to understand that as well. Now, if you want to know all of these things, I talk about all of these items uh, in detail and, and give you lots more information about them, how to think like a historian, in my book, Proving History. Uh, and right now, of course, this is my job. This is the only employment I have is selling these books. So I would very much appreciate it if you could help me out and, and uh, bring me some income for, for what I do and buy some of my books. But Proving History is the one that will cover this in detail. And if you want to know more about the origins of Christianity, uh, among the books that are here today, the best one to buy would be Not the Impossible Faith, if the, any copies are left. Uh, so that's it. Uh, thank you for your attention, and, and go forward and uh, think like a historian. Yeah.